So hello and welcome. I'll just give people a few moments to get settled in. Okay, I think uh, we'll just wait a couple more minutes or a few more moments, I should say, and then, and then we'll kick off. Hope everyone's having a great day and enjoying this very warm weather, weather that we've been having. Yeah. Okay, so I think I will begin. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caitlin Jaggers and I am the research lead for the Research Knowledge Translation and Exchange team here at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. The Alzheimer's Society of Canada is very pleased to welcome you to another ASRP exchange presentation that is being offered through our provincial support program. This series has been developed to feature Alzheimer's Society research program recipients who have completed their funding and who will speak to the outcomes of their ASRP supported research while addressing how their results have and will continue to impact individuals with lived experience. Joining us today is Sarah Sarovich, the new research program assistant at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, who will be presenting today's agenda and will be providing a brief introduction for our ASRP exchange presenter. Hello everyone and welcome. As mentioned, my name is Sarah Sarovich and I will be helping to co-host today's ASRP exchange webinar. I would like to start off today's webinar by going through the agenda presented here, and then I will pass it over to our presenter, Dr. Vanessa Toller. Before we begin, please note this webinar is estimated to be under one hour in length and is being recorded, but that only the video and audio of the presenters is captured during this recording. The presentation recording, in addition to the PowerPoint slides in PDF form, will be made available on connection for Alzheimer's Society staff, as well as on the Alzheimer's Society of Canada's website on our ASRP Exchange webpage following today's webinar. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Vanessa Toller and is being offered as one of the ASRP Exchange webinars within our Provincial Support Program Meet the Researcher series. We are so pleased to have Dr. Toller here with us today to present her project Studying Semantics in People with Mild Cognitive Impairment and Alzheimer's Disease, Development of a Short Screening Tool. This project was funded by the Alzheimer's Society Research Program, the ASRP, starting in July 2017 with project completion ending in June 2019. Dr. Toller is an associate professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Ottawa and a scientist at the Bruyere Research Institute. Her research interests focus on semantic and cognitive processing in cognitively healthy older adults, as well as people with mild cognitive imp impairment, MCI, and Alzheimer's disease, AD. A second major area of research is language and cognitive, um, language and cognitive processing in bilinguals. She uses electrophysiological and behavioral techniques to study these questions. Dr. Toller is also the lead site investigator for the Ottawa site of the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, CLSA, a large national long-term study that will follow approximately 50,000 middle-aged and older people for at least 20 years, collecting information on the changing biological, medical, psychological, social, lifestyle, and economic aspects of people's lives. At the end of today's presentation, Caitlin Jaggers will be moderating a short question and answer period. Please use the Zoom chat box feature if you have any comments you would like to make or questions you would like to pose during the presentation. However, please note we will hold off on asking our presenter to respond until after she has completed her presentation. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Vanessa Toller. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I will uh, share my slides for everyone. Is that visible to everyone? Uh, so I, I will, I'm, thank you everyone, first of all, for being here. And I will be talking to you about a project that I'm very grateful to the Alzheimer's Society for having funded. 
and uh, presenting some of the findings we have looking at semantics or uh, knowledge of words and meanings in people with uh, mild cognitive impairment, MCI, and Alzheimer's disease. Um, so before I start with the presentation, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you all today from Ottawa, which is situated on the traditional lands of the Algonquin people. And I would like to acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. So to start out, I wanted to present a little vignette to you to illustrate what we mean when we talk about semantic knowledge or semantic memory. And this is from a classic paper in semantics, Patterson et al, 2007. They present uh, this case study of a man called Mr. M. He is a patient with something called semantic dementia. So this is a neurodegenerative disease that is characterized by the gradual deterioration of semantic memory. So he was being driven through the countryside to visit a friend and was able to remind his wife where to turn along the route which he had not recently traveled along. And then he pointed at the sheep in the field that he was passing and said to her, what are those things? And prior to the onset of these symptoms, which occurred in his late 40s, this man had normal semantic memory. So the question that we have is, what has gone wrong in his brain? What happened to produce this dramatic and selective erosion of conceptual knowledge? So this is an illustration of a, a, a case where somebody has a type of dementia that specifically affects what we call semantic memory. So what is semantic memory? This is a type of long-term memory. And really what it is is encoding uh, culturally shared knowledge about objects, facts, places, people, concepts, including the knowledge of words and their meanings. And it's critically important for most cognitive functions. So in the case of Mr. M, he has a dramatic selective impairment in semantic memory while having normal uh, memory in other domains so he can remember where to turn to visit his friend and so on. Uh, and we know that semantic memory is stored in the brain in the uh, anterior, so the bottom part or front part of your temporal lobe. So sort of this, you can see here's your brain. This is the front part of the brain and it's sort of like this part here. And what we think when we're thinking about how we, sh we store this knowledge in our brain, one of the kind of more recent theories that seems to really hold up under research scrutiny is that we have what we call a hub of semantic knowledge here in the anterior temporal lobe in this part of the brain. And it's connected to all different other types of knowledge that we have. So the name of something here in orange, an action associated with it. So let's say you have the word fork so you know that what a fork is, the action of moving it. We can think about colors. So we know, for example, that bananas are yellow, a motion associated with it. So all these different things that we know about all of these objects in the world are stored sort of in a distributed fashion throughout the brain. But really the idea is that we need to go through the central semantic hub, this part of the brain that is uh, responsible for kind of like a way station for all of this information. So here on the right, what we have is a representation of what happens when, for example, we show somebody a picture and we ask them to say what it is. So I show you a picture of a banana and I say, what is the, tell me what the word is for this. So you have your shape, that's your input here in green, we see shape, and then you have some sort of representation of what a banana is that isn't related to the task that you're being asked to do. So it's not related necessarily to naming that object, the banana, but just the things you know about bananas. And then you have some sort of task dependent representation that you will activate based on what it is you're being asked to do. So this can seem kind of esoteric, right? Like it's it's a very theoretical, but it becomes very important when we're thinking about how we assess semantic memory when we're working with people that have problems or potentially have problems with semantic memory. So I gave you the case of Mr. M uh, who has semantic dementia, but we also know that semantic memory is affected in other neurological disorders. So very commonly in stroke, and I'm gonna show you some data from people who've had stroke, different types of neurodegenerative disease, uh, in Alzheimer's disease and in mild cognitive impairment. When we think about that, we sort of think about this 
hallmark deficit in memory. So what did I have for breakfast this morning? Like this type of memory. But we know that even very early on, you start seeing changes in semantic memory in people with Alzheimer's disease or with mild cognitive impairment. So this is important because it means that it's uh, very, we need to assess how people's semantic memory looks and also to make the differential diagnosis of does somebody have semantic dementia? How severe is the semantic deficit relative to somebody who might have some other type of neurodegenerative disorder. So it's we know that, that this is a central uh, component of cognition that we need to assess, but it's very challenging to do this in real life because you need to assess across multiple modalities. So that would mean that we want to assess if I present something to you visually, if it's auditory, if you see words, if you see pictures. So what we're trying to get at is that task independent representation that I showed you in the prior slide. So you want to get at it from all different angles. And if you have a problem with your semantics, then you should show deficits across all of these different modalities. And then also, if you think about somebody who has trouble with language, it may be that they have difficulties with tasks where they have to say something, but they may be able to perform a task where they have to point at the correct response. So you really want to make sure you're assessing across multiple modalities, especially if people have speech difficulties or visual agnosia, so difficulties in recognizing visual objects. This can really complicate the assessment of semantic memory, especially if you're using just a single task, like typically we'll use maybe just a picture naming task where I show you pictures and you tell me what they are. Uh, and it can also be affected by the language background of the client or participant. So if somebody is bilingual or if they're performing the task in a language that is not their own, that can impact their performance. So we really need to, uh, we need a good measure. There are existing measures of semantic memory, but we really need to take into account all of these different modalities and these different factors that can impact how people perform on semantic memory tasks. Uh, just a little, this may be familiar for many of you, but just I wanted to, when we're talking about mild cognitive impairment, show you what it, what it is that I'm talking about. So here we have a slide, a, a graph showing what happens. So this is a person's cognitive function over the course of years as they age, or in some cases as people progress toward uh, dementia. And what we see is that for some people, there might be declines in cognitive function that are related to aging, but in other people, the cognitive function, the decline is more rapid and steep, and they will pass through a phase here called MCI, where you see some changes in their cognition, some difficulties, but they're still, their social and occupational function is okay. They're aware typically that there's a problem. So that's what we would call subjective cognitive impairment. And MCI, people who have MCI don't necessarily go on, some remain at that stage or even revert back to normal cognition, but it constitutes a risk factor for dementia. So in many, but not all cases, it's a transitional state between cognitive health and dementia. So this means that it's very um, uh, important to understand what's happening cognitively at that stage, not least because when we start having potentially therapies for, uh, for dementia, they're most likely to be useful sort of early on in the, in the disease course. And so having a good sense of who is at risk for developing dementia is very important for Alzheimer's research. So our goal in this study was to develop and validate a battery or a group of tasks assessing semantic function across multiple modalities. So we use different tasks and different modalities. And we can the battery contains tasks. I'm going to show you what they are. But we assess semantic function using spoken and written input and output, picture input, so showing pictures and asking people to name them or respond to them, and also uh, pointing as well as spoken output. So really covering all of the different modalities, input and output modalities. So here are the tasks that we developed. And we um, so we have tasks where people are just asked to name a picture. So they'll see a picture such as a helicopter here, or sometimes an action such as juggling in this case. And so some are pictures of biological items or like uh, animals or fruits, vegetables, and so on. Some are what we call artifacts. So that just means man-made. So like a helicopter, for example, and then action items. And they're asked to either say what the item is 
or to write it down. So we have a total of 18 different items that they speak aloud to say what they're looking at and 18 that they write down. So that would be because some people will have difficulty with speech, but they may be able to write. So that's tasks 1A and 1B. And then this is another type of test where we have an item. So here you have a pillow and it's either, we had pictures and words. So the picture of the pillow, and then you have to say, which of these four things does the pillow go with? So people will respond that the pillow goes with the bed. So we have, again, some biological and some artifact, and then some with pictures and some with words. So this is tasks 2A and 2B. And then task three, uh, we ask people how what things have in common. So this is accessing semantic features or specific pieces of knowledge that we have about, uh, about different items. So for example, how is a tiger like a zebra? And we ask them, first of all, to tell us, to generate a response. And then secondly, they have a multiple choice option where they have to choose, both have stripes, both have spots, both are animals, both are vegetables. So in this case, and they're asked to identify the most specific feature. So in this case, the answer is that both have stripes. It's true that both are animals, but both have stripes as a more specific feature. Uh, and then finally, task four, they're asked uh, semantic questions. So for example, does a kangaroo come from China and is a soccer ball usually thrown? So of course, what we need to do first of all is figure out how people respond to that when they don't have a semantic deficit. So the, before we did any of that, we went and, and consulted with some clinicians. So we did a study looking at uh, the uh, properties. So what we we call the face below, whether the test seems to clinicians with experience with uh, dementia to capture what we are trying to capture. So we uh, interviewed uh, two neuropsychologists and one MD and two researchers from either a research institute or a hospital-based memory program or university. And these are all people with expertise in mild cognitive impairment and language function. And we did uh, structured interviews and asked them a bunch of questions, uh, either to rate or open-ended questions. And what we wanted to know was whether they thought the battery was effective, relevant, and appropriate. So the battery overall and each task. So this is really kind of a first check to make sure that clinicians who are actually going to be doing the assessment think that the uh, that the the work will be useful, that the battery will be useful. So overall, they thought that it was an appropriate assessment of semantic function, easy to administer, logical, easy to use, useful and relevant. And they um, and assessed multiple aspects of semantic memory. So basically, they liked the the battery. They thought that it would be useful in uh, in clinic. Actually, I had one say to me, "It's like you read my mind. I've really been needing a measure of semantic function, a short me short measure of semantic function. So thank you for, for for doing this work, which was very validating to hear from a from a clinician. And they also pointed out that it's likely appropriate for populations other than MCI. So Alzheimer's disease, aphasia. So this is where somebody after, um, usually after a brain injury, such as a stroke, develops language problems. Uh, progress, primary progressive aphasia, which is uh, similar to semantic dementia that we talked about at the beginning, and people with, the, uh, with a traumatic brain injury. So uh, encouraged by these results, we went on to administer this battery to people with um, uh, either cognitively healthy older adults or people who have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment from the Breer memory program. And then 20 of those people, the cognitively healthy participants, we asked them to complete it again six months later so we can look at what we call test retest reliability. So whether we get similar results uh, each time that it's administered. And we also had people complete in order to check that we're really getting at what we want to get at. We had people do, uh, complete um, standardized tasks of semantic function. So these are things that would normally be uh, used by a neuropsychologist. So the Boston naming test, which is a test of picture naming, people have 60 items and they say uh, that they name the of increasing difficulty. So they start with things like bed and flower. And then at the end, you end up with things like um, uh, stethoscope or uh, pyramid, so more um, more protractor, kind of more difficult uh, difficult items. So that's we have very good norms for the Boston naming test, and so we're able to see. Uh, we want to see that people who do poorly on the Boston naming test also do poorly on the semantic battery, and people who do well do well on both. So that means that we're kind of capturing the same uh, underlying cognitive 
uh, process. And then also the pyramids and palm trees test, which is another standardized test similar to the one with the pillow and the bed, except with just two items. So they see a picture or a word and then have to match it to one of the two pictures or words that they're presented with. Okay, so we had 102 older adults and 60 people with MCI. Uh, and here we have their, so the average age, mid, uh, mid 70s, and then average education for this group was quite high, like around 16 years, which is the equivalent of um, an undergraduate degree. So we're actually, and you'll see in an upcoming slide for our ongoing research, we're, we're trying to collect more data. We were very slowed down by the pandemic. We we'd, uh, we'd suspended, um, uh, data collection, but we're trying to um, uh, to extend our data collection to a broader range of, uh, of educational uh, levels. So here we have, I'll just walk you through this uh, very quickly. These are all the different tasks and in blue you have the performance so that it's just percent correct, the top 100 here, performance in older adults and then people with MCI. Everybody did pretty well, which is what you would expect because uh, the um, the semantic deficit that you see in MCI, first of all, not everyone with MCI has a semantic deficit, and also it's quite minor at that point. So you would expect to see a much bigger effect with somebody, for example, with semantic dementia. And MCI, it really is like you have to kind of conduct these tasks to see the deficit. It's not, somebody won't say, what is that about a, about a sheep? So what we saw is that overall, our cognitively healthy older adults outperformed people with MCI in every task except for the word word matching. So that's where it's the one with the pillow and the bed, but they have words instead of pictures. And the reason that we didn't see a difference there is because everybody did really very close to 100%, like really close to ceiling. So this task for people with MCI is not sensitive enough to uh, identify any deficits, but that doesn't mean that the task doesn't have value because as you'll see in a moment we conducted a similar test in French using people with aphasia and we saw effects in uh, in all of the um, in all of the tasks so this was our overall performance and then I will I'm not going to read all of this to you but this is really where it, what we were testing here is what we call the psychometric properties so is the test working as it should. And so the first thing we look at is what we call convergent validity. So this is where you want, you're looking at whether the performance on our new task is similar to the performance on already existing tasks that we know tap semantic function. And overall, yes, we found that that was the case. So performance on the overall battery and on most of the subtasks correlated significantly with performance on the um, existing semantic measures. So one question you may have, of course, is why are we doing this if we have measures that already exist? And uh, the reason is, first of all, because it's much shorter and we're actually going to make ongoing research. We're going to make a, a mini battery that really only takes five to eight minutes to complete. And also because it's assessing multiple modalities, whereas the existing tests in large part are assessing just a single modality. So a naming test, for example. So the, the convergent validity was good. And also we're looking at things like if two different people score the test, do we get the same results? And the answer is yes. So we call that inter-rater reliability. Uh, test retest reliability. So the people who did it again six months later, again, uh, they we didn't find any difference between the first and the second testing sessions. And internal consistency. So are all the items within the test kind of patterning together? And again, we found that the, the test had a good level of internal consistency. So basically, we're pretty happy with the psychometric properties of the full, uh, the full semantic battery. So then we were also interested, so this was uh, in our Alzheimer's Society grant was listed as like ongoing research, so future research. It was not actually part of the original test, but my collaborator in uh, at Laval, uh, Laura Moneta, who's a, a researcher and a speech language pathologist at University Laval, uh, was, so she works a lot with clinicians there. And we have tests in English. There's really, for researchers, it's really challenging in French because there aren't as many uh, tests available. You can't just translate a test, you have to adapt it. So uh, for clinicians working in French, it really is very challenging to, um, to do this type of assessment. They don't have as many options as people working in English. And so she found that when she was talking to people about this, they said, please publish this, please do the French work. So we started to examine performance. We developed a French version of the battery. It's a little bit different some items didn't work in English and French. And actually the one 
test where we um, we asked people, how is a tiger like a zebra? And they had to tell us the answer. It did not work at all in French. Nobody was able to, to do that. Like the task just doesn't. So this is an example of why you can't just translate tests. The, the instructions somehow didn't make sense to people. They couldn't understand what it was that we were that we were asking them to do. So we removed that task from the French battery. And she, uh, I'm gonna present here data from cognitively healthy older adults and also people with aphasia. So this is what I was talking about in acquired language def deficit. So typically someone who's had a stroke and subsequent to that has difficulties with language. So at the moment we've tested, for this I'm gonna show you 14, um, 14 older adults and 14 people with aphasia. Uh, the age is a bit younger than our MCI group and the education is a little bit lower. So a little bit above a high school completion, 12 years is high school completion. And um, what we found here are the results, orange is people with aphasia and blue is uh, people who are cognitively healthy. And as you can see, um, strong effects on all tasks. So people, and this is what you would expect because people with aphasia have language difficulties. So we're seeing really this core semantic deficit that you see across all of the different modalities and tasks. Uh, you'll notice the word word matching, which is the one that didn't uh, show any difference in English. Here in French, you do see a difference in, the, in people with aphasia, but again, it's the smallest difference of any of the tasks. So this particular task seems like it's maybe just a little bit easier or less sensitive to deficits than the other, um, than the other tasks. So these are sort of hopeful results. And again, they, we looked at the psychometric properties in French. So is the test working well? Uh, of the people with aphasia, there were six that we knew had semantic deficits. So they were compared with six control participants that were matched and uh, sensitivity was 100% and specificity was 67%. So what that means is that uh, the semantic battery was able to identify everybody that had aphasia and then it misclassified a couple of the people with um, co who were cognitively healthy as uh, as having aphasia. So it was this is excellent sensitivity. The specificity will will need to identify the items maybe that are so this is sort of ongoing work to figure out which items maybe are are not working so well, but it's still pretty good. And then again, we did test, we test reliability. Uh, we tested eight control participants three months later, and again, there was no difference. So good uh, test, retest, re reliability. Cronbach's alpha, so that was the what I was talking about, the internal consistency. So whether within a given task, all of the items seem to go together, work together, correlate together. It was very high for spoken naming and for picture picture matching, and then lower for the rest of the tasks. So again, there may be items that um, that need to be removed. So moving forward, we see that there are two tasks that seem to be the strongest in the battery for the the um, for the French uh, version of the battery. Overall, the psychometric properties were very good. And so ongoing, uh, we're doing ongoing data collection. We have normative data now for 96 people in French aged 19 to 90. So we're basically trying to get as much as many responses as possible. And then we'll be able to identify which of the items should be removed to give us the strongest, uh, the strongest battery. So uh, overall, we see that um, in English, we see deficits across uh, all semantic tasks with the exception of the word word matching and MCI and the largest effect sizes. So the strongest effect was in the spoken picture naming, which was the same uh, task that was working very well in French. So this seems to be a test that's quite sensitive to um, to MCI and to aphasia. So going forward, we're able to recommend to clinicians that if you only have time for one test of semantic uh, semantic knowledge, probably spoken picture naming is your best bet to choose. Uh, we saw good psychometric properties, so the, the, the battery seemed to be working quite well. Um, and then in French, we saw deficits in all of the tasks for people with aphasia. And again, spoken picture naming and picture picture matching were the most effective tasks. So we're this is uh, although our, our funding has ended from the the Alzheimer's Society, the the grant term has ended. We're still continuing with this uh, with this work. So we're continuing to collect norms. We've actually just started uh, collecting. I have a student who for the summer is collecting norms. Uh, online. So because we're going to be doing, I think, uh, as we move forward in our new world, more uh, remote testing, we're trying to see how well this works if we do it um, in an internet-based way instead of in person. 
Uh, we're collecting norms from a larger group across adult age ranges. And then uh, the ultimate goal is to develop this mini battery of uh, five to eight minutes long that clinicians will be able to use, uh, that will be very efficient for clinicians to use. So I think I, within 25 minutes, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for, uh, for listening and thank my collaborators and students at the University of Ottawa and uh, Université Laval and the Alzheimer's Society, of course, for, uh, for funding. And especially I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, time and effort of our participants who are a joy to work with and without whom we would never be able to do any of this work. So uh, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Vanessa. That was an incredible presentation. I'll just hand it over uh, to Sarah to um, share her slides once you have um, stopped I'll sharing. I'll stop sharing. Wonderful, and uh, perfect. Where did I... I think we're good. I think the, the ASC slides are back up. Okay, great. Um, so firstly, just thank you again for such an incredible presentation. I think you really shed light on an area that isn't as frequently discussed. And I certainly mm -hmm. learned a lot with regards to semantic memory and even mild cognitive impairment and the difference between, um, you know, mild cognitive impairment and dementia. That graph that you showed was a really mm -hmm. great indication of how um, memory decline can vary between different stages. So I found it very informative. Um, and just thank you again for taking the time to share these results with us. So uh, I'd now like to open it up to our audience members to ask any questions or uh, pose any comments that they have into our question and answer box or the chat box, both features should be available to you. Um, so you can just use those whenever you're ready. And uh, in the meantime, and while we wait for the audience to ask their questions, there are um, a couple questions that I was hoping to pose to you, uh, Vanessa, if you don't mind. So uh, the, the first is just in terms of, you know, relevance of what the world is going through. You mentioned that um, aspects of your project have been impacted by the pandemic, by COVID-19. And Indeed. so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to um, any advice you might have for researchers who are pursuing projects during the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, okay. Um, so we, uh, we had to, I, uh, uh, as when you introduced me, you talked about my research that I do in my lab. And then you also talked about uh, me being the, the collection, the lead for the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. So my lab, we just closed down totally. I decided that it was uh, too high risk. We're in a hospital environment. I work with older adults. I decided it was too high risk to continue data collection. We're just now starting now. People are sort of many people are vaccinated and we're starting to open up again uh, at the hospital. The CLSA continued throughout uh, and we had to pivot very quickly to online and telephone based uh, data collection. And it's a huge national study. So it was a it was a lot of work to do that. Um, I think that I mean there's lots of kind of uh, specific things about how to which platforms to use and how to do recruitment that we've kind of figured out with our colleagues as we're going through everyone's going through this together. How do you do online recruitment? It's very different. How do you maintain engagement with people? So I think for my type of research, it's very useful to have this sort of one on one where uh, the research assistant or student will call the person as opposed to trying to do things just uh, on the web. Right, that doesn't like an open here. Click this link and fill this survey out. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't work so well. You get a very. You get a bias in terms of the people that that you're going to be recruiting. And I think we're going to have to all adapt to this kind of tele. Like clinicians have had to adapt to tele telehealth um, assessments. Uh, where the world seems to have adapted very quickly to Zoom, for example, we all like we didn't even know what Zoom was a year and a half ago, and now we are all uh, zoomed out and in Zoom fatigue. So, uh, but again, often with with older people, that can be a challenge, and it's also a challenge. Not everybody necessarily has internet connections or like a reliable computer. So, I think it's really important to think about kind of equity issues when we're determining who we are including in our research and uh, how we're how we're recruiting people. So having a flexibility to be able to assess by phone instead of on the internet, for example, is, is really important. And uh, 
other than that, I think like ideally we're, I think we also, it's an opportunity as well, right? To have a research that's, um, we don't have to make people drive into the hospital and try and park downtown and get stressed out bringing, we are, we're able to do this where it can increase accessibility at the same time if we do it right. Yeah, that's a great point, accessibility and just opening it up to different areas is you know, another possibility when you're not restricted to a specific location or a specific distance, you can exactly. go more broadly across uh, Canada or international if that's the type of study that you are conducting. So I think that's great advice and some really good input in, in challenging times, but as you mentioned, times that do provide for new opportunities in ways that we didn't expect. And identifying the problems that we're having as well, right? So I think that that it really this shed a light on, for example, there have been people who've always had lower accessibility like doing so. I have a colleague who works on rural telehealth stuff and she's like, we've been dealing with these problems all along and nobody noticed, let alone like everything that happens in long-term care. Like the pandemic has really shown us a lot of the cracks that were there that we, so now this is our chance to try and get it right. Yeah, thank you. That's a great point. Um, something else I just wanted to ask was you highlighted a few times the importance of, you know, targeting memory impairments or semantic memory issues early on, the significance of, mm -hmm. of starting early in these types of tests. And I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more to the importance of, of starting at that earlier stage. So ideally, there's sort of two ways to think about this. So I don't do a pharmacological research, but uh, it is fairly clear that uh, that any type of pharmacological intervention will be people, uh, it's likely to work better if you can catch people earlier. So uh, what that means is that there's been this huge amount of research interest in MCI as like a risk factor for, for dementia, for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, and really identifying who people are. So the way that we're going to do that, we can do uh, biomarkers, but biomarkers aren't perfect, right? Like you want to look at the cognitive performance as well, because we know that people can have, for example, neuropathology, Alzheimer type neuropathology, and yet be cognitively healthy and not show deficits in cognition. So you really want to have uh, sensitive markers of cognitive uh, um, deficits that catch the deficits as early as possible and identify. So ideally, we do longitudinal research where you can see uh, how if we as if we administer this, and we know, for example, with some of the semantic tests that exist. So. Uh, for example, a verbal fluency task where I say, tell me all the animals you can think of in one minute, that people will start showing deficits in that way before any onset of dementia. So it's quite sensitive quite early on. So uh, there's the the sort of importance of this early diagnosis and also from a from the perspective of just when people are making decisions financial decisions and like kind of family planning decisions the earlier you know what's going to happen and what a tra what trajectory you have the the more time you have to make those decisions and really kind of prepare yourself so i think it's both in terms of future potential treatments and in terms of like real life right now, how do people manage what's happening? I think that really uh, having a good idea of what to expect is one of the uh, major goals of research in, in, uh, in dementia. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. That was worded very, very well and it definitely you know showcases a key priority in vast mm -hmm. types of dementia research and really you know, targeting as soon as you can. I know that's something that many researchers are, are trying to do. Yeah. Um, I also just wanted to, you know, shed light on the fact that you had used different types of, of tasks, different types of questions mm -hmm. for people to address. So you went over, you know, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, yeah. and so on. And, you know, this isn't necessarily a question, but more just a comment. I think it was very important for us as audience members to see the types of questions that can be asked. I think sometimes we're limited in, in thinking about how you test one's memory or how you um, yeah. might, you know, associate words or, or images and how that can differ. So I, I just want to mention that that was something that was very interesting for it's, me to hear about. And, and you know, as you showed the, the different test results between um, the two studies. So, you know, for mm -hmm. aphasia, it was, it was more of a drastic um, difference. And I just think that that was very important for us to hear about. I do see a question in the chat box. Um, so would yes. your test 
difficulties catch, catch yeah. yeah difficulties yeah. resulting from MTBI. Yes, so I would. Uh, uh, that's a great question, and um, that was one of the things that the the, the um, one of our uh, participants in the face validity study had brought up. Actually, I think more than one said that TBI would be uh, uh, um, that the semantic battery would be appropriate for people with TBI. So we haven't done that study yet, but we do know that. So actually, my my graduate student uh, Mark Bedard just finished his PhD in clinical psychology. He just defended his thesis, and he was looking at uh, long term cognitive difficulties in, in MTBI. So uh, that's mild traumatic brain injury. So uh, what he found was that there is most people. So that kind of received wisdom is that your cognition recovers after. So mild TBI is essentially like a concussion, right? So it's, uh, we've sort of had this received wisdom for a long time that people have acute problems, but then like everything's fine after a while. And what he found is that there's a subset of people who have long-term uh, cognitive changes as a result of MTVI, which is consistent with what clinicians have been observing, but he was able to do this with the, the CLSA data, which is 30,000 participants. So he had a pretty large sample of people with MTVI. And, and CLSA, of course, because of the nature of the study, doesn't have as extensive of a neuropsych battery as so they don't have anything like this. And I would predict that it's quite likely that there'd be a subset of people with MTBI that you would be able to catch the mild deficits using uh, using the semantic uh, semantic battery. So, yes, and I'm sure we'll do it at some point. We'd like to test as many populations as possible. Great, thank you. I was also hoping, you know, you you moved your study forward and started assessing um, the tool for French speaking individuals. Mm -hmm. You you took that approach, and I was just you you mentioned that certain questions don't translate the same way yeah. uh, for tools. And I was wondering if you could just expand upon that a little bit more. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting question, right? Because it's not so when you're uh, when you're doing neuropsych testing, like many of these tools exist in lots of languages and often they're just kind of translated. And sometimes even, for example, if you think about the semantic test, there are some things that are more familiar, like items that, that we might know in like English Canada that would be less frequent in French Canada. Or, you know, so for the Boston naming test, they have cactus as one of the items. And in the American Southwest, they accept saguaro as an alternate uh, uh, response that's graded as correct. Right, so they kind of they have to make these kind of cultural adaptations even within. So actually, for some of the existing uh, uh, neuropsych alternate neuropsych assessments, they've been developed in, for example, Australia, where the vocabulary is maybe a little bit different. So you'll have, or you'll just have words that don't translate. So we had one of the items was a um, stroller. See, I grew up in New Zealand, where we call that like a baby buggy. <laughs> so a stroller, and. Uh, in French, there's multiple different words for stroller. So what that means is if you have somebody who's showing up with a semantic deficit and I show them a picture of a stroller and say, tell me what this is, they have lots of different competing things that they could say, right? Different words that mean the same thing. Or another example is corn, which can translate as mace or blé d'end, right? There's two words for corn in French. And so you, if you have aphasia and you have difficulty accessing like word forms, like lexical items, and you have two that are competing, it makes the task more difficult, right? So you can see that at the item level. And then even at the, there's something I, I'm not really, this is sort of my sense. I don't know that there's uh, studies that have really looked at this, but uh, I think about how kids are taught to read. Right. And in English, we're taught, like, look at this picture and tell me what it is. We do so much picture naming when we're little kids, right? Like, that's how we sort of learn how to recognize word forms. Not every language, not in, not every, it's not everywhere that kids are taught in that way. And so that's going to impact because picture naming is sort of a weird task, right? Like, all of these tasks are weird. Which thing does the pillow go with? You don't really do that in real life. So, your educational background from your childhood and how ideas and concepts were presented to you is going to affect how natural the task seems to you. So that's why we test, I mean, that's why we test everything out, right? We don't go with my assumption of whether people know that kangaroos come from China or whatever. We're always testing lots of people to make sure that it makes sense as a question and uh, problems and answering it are reflective of actual semantic difficulties and not something about the item itself. 
Great, thank you. And I think this next question speaks uh, to your oh. point a little bit more, but since we are a multicultural society, would the tests eventually be translated into other languages? Yeah, so we're actually working on translating it into Spanish right now with another colleague. So my colleague in, in Quebec City is actually from Argentina, and then my mother is from El Salvador, so we have the whole Spanish relationship, and then we have now a new Mexican guy we're working with, so we're actually looking to translate it into Spanish, and ideally, yes, it, it would be, we would like it in lots of languages, and then the other question is around bilingualism, right? So people who are bilingual perform differently on these types of semantic tests. So in my lab, typically we try and test people who are monolingual anglophone when we're doing it in English, just to avoid like the sort of the differences in performance that people may have if they're if they're bilingual. But I have, as I'd um, as I research screen looking at bilingual. Well, I think you might have frozen. Sarah, are you experiencing the same? that perform in the same way in the in those different groups. So there's a, a whole lifetime of work to do there. Thank you. Yeah, I think we caught the most of that. Just at one point you did you did freeze a little bit, but I think we captured most of, okay. <laughs> of your answer to that question. Um, so I think one thing that, you know, more generally speaking, if you had to, you know, decide on one thing you would like our audience members remember about your research, what would you like that to be? Uh, I would like audience, so the, I, I guess the, the importance of good clinical assessment with uh, well-developed tools at, at, at uh, different, assessing different cognitive domains. So people often will think about Alzheimer's disease as like it's just a memory problem. And so the idea that you, it's, uh, I would like people to understand the importance of looking at cognition broadly, including semantic memory. And uh, I think the, um, the importance also of the cultural aspects of doing it in French and English and the challenges around like uh, assessing people with different language backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds, that the need to be sensitive to that and not just assume that everybody's kind of just a, a regular Canadian brought up weird anglophone, monolingual anglophone. There's lots of people that have different backgrounds. Wonderful, thank you, Yen. I, I will say the the piece about looking at cognition more broadly is something that stuck with me as soon as you concluded yeah. your presentation. So I think you did an excellent job of really conveying that message as well as the importance thank of you. you know multilingual approaches, multicultural approaches. You did a fantastic job really in explaining that so thoroughly. Um, so I'm not seeing any further questions in our chat box. Um, so it looks like we might be able to end a little bit early today. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the next thing I want to do is just uh, notify our audience members and listeners that you can access this recording uh, of this presentation on the Alzheimer's Society of Canada website. And you, if you are a Alzheimer's Society of Canada staff member, you can access this through Connection. Um, and Connection will also host the slides in PDF form. And if you do have any questions about this presentation, or anything more generally about the ASRP exchange series, you can email psp at alzheimer.ca. And sorry, there's a bit of background noise here, but uh, Sarah, if you could just uh, flip to the next slide. I just want to briefly introduce our next upcoming presentation as part of the ASRP exchange series. So on July 14th, we do have another presentation scheduled for 12 p.m. EST by Dr. Dama, who is a biomedical postdoctoral award recipient. And Dr. Dama will be explaining eye imaging and dementia models, understanding the progression of the tau protein, and will be explaining that uh, and the results of his project. And this presentation will also require registration, and I've just provided that registration link there at the bottom of the slide. So I think that is sufficient to wrap up today's webinar. Again, thank you very much, Vanessa, for such an insightful presentation, very informative with a lot of important messages to take home. And I think we will close off there. So thank you to everyone who attended and we hope to see you at the next presentation. Thank you. Thanks everybody.